When the Wright brothers made history by taking flight in 1903, they ushered in a new era of transportation. Since then, some people have tried and failed to improve the airplane design, with others succeeding. But there is one man who is determined to change how we look at airplanes and how they fly. At the time, he created a design that was viewed as too advanced, watching his dream be destroyed, only to be redeemed in his final months. His work played a critical role in one of America's most advanced aircraft. This is the story of Jack Northrop in his creation, The Flying Wing. John Knudsen Northrop was born on November 10, 1995 in Newark, New Jersey to Charles Wheeler Northrop Jr. and his wife Helen. He did have two half-brothers from his mother's side, Roy Alston Lippincott and Donald Knudsen Lippincott, although it is unclear if Northrop was brought up as an only child or was raised with his half-brothers. In 1906, his father moved him and his mother west to Santa Barbara, California, where Charlie operated a construction business from 1906 to 1923. Jack became interested in flying thanks to Didier Maison, who he saw flying over Los Angeles and had turned himself the world's greatest flyer, and the seagulls he saw flying overhead whenever he was at the beach. The latter would be a crucial part of Jack Northrop's career later on. After he completed high school in 1913, Jack went to work for a man named William Rust after inheriting his father's skill of working on automobiles. It wouldn't be until two brothers set up shop in Rust's garage that his life would change forever. Northrop was hired by brothers Allen and Malcolm Lowhead in 1916. While there, he worked on the Lowhead F-1 flying boat. His role in the plane design was the 74-foot wide wings, and he participated in the design of the whole of the plane, and the eponage, the whole tail section of the aircraft. However, his time was cut short after he was drafted into the army as an infantryman. An unknown individual recognized his talents and transferred him to the U.S. Army Signal Corps, the branch responsible for overseeing much of the Army's aviation at the time. The Lowhead brothers requested he be exempt from military service and were successful after six months. He went back to the company, where his pay went from $252 to a staggering $1,800. Unfortunately, Lowhead Aircraft Manufacturing Company was forced to close in 1920 due to the aircraft being sold being more expensive than the surplus World War I aircraft. During his second time with the company, he married Ines Harmer on January 30, 1918. They would have two children together, John Harmer Northrop, born February 22, 1923, and Ines Stephanie Northrop, born December 18, 1924. They would eventually divorce in 1949. In 1923, he went to work at Douglas Aircraft Company where he made another engineering breakthrough in the form of the fuel tank system on the Douglas World Cruiser. These aircraft were famed for being the first aircraft to fly around the world, with their trip taking over 175 calendar days and covering 26,345 miles. This was due in part to Northrop increasing the fuel capacity from 115 gallons to 644 gallons, roughly five times more fuel than before. In 1927, he left Douglas and rejoined the Lowhead brothers, who would change their name to Lockheed and join their company to the Lockheed Corporation. At Lockheed, he became co-designer of the Lockheed Vega along with Gerald Volte. The aircraft was a massive success and was credited with several records. Two Lockheed Vegas are currently in possession of the Smithsonian Institution. One of them is the Weenie May, which was flown by Wiley Post and was credited with several world records at the time, including the fastest flight around the world in 9 hours, 9 minutes, and 4 seconds in 1931, and the highest altitude at 50,000 feet in 1934, which was done using a suit similar to deep sea divers. The second is the plane flown by Amelia Earhart to cross the Atlantic, not to be confused with the plane used in her attempt to fly around the world. While working for Lockheed, Northrop started working on designs for an aircraft that would change the way the world looked at aircraft. He started working on the flying wing design. Having taken inspiration from the Seagulls in his younger years, he left the Lockheed Corporation in 1929 to set out on his own. However, by the late 1930s, he had already given up on at least one company, some sources say two. He was on his second try when the competition for the flying wing began to heat up. When World War II broke out, aircraft had evolved. They were on the front lines of almost every major campaign. One side that invested heavily in aircraft technology was the German military. Before the war, two brothers, Walter and Reimer Horton, had been working on gliders which had no tail, but the German Air Force would not be interested until 1942. 
Their design and research led them to develop the Horton HO-229. However, the plane came too late to play a role in the war, with only three being built. It was reported that this plane had stealth characteristics, something that will be discussed later in this video. While the Hortons were working on their flying wing, Northrop was working on his design. First by scaling down the tail section of an aircraft before eliminating it altogether. This led to him designing the Northrop N1M, which was quickly followed up by the Northrop N9M. It's important to note that though the projects focus on similar goals and closely resembling designs, there is no evidence of Northrop having any knowledge of the Horton's development and vice versa. The N1M and N9M were test subjects with the ultimate goal of making a larger version of the flying wing and turning it into a heavy bomber. Unfortunately, Northrop's dream wouldn't be ready until after World War II had ended. But due to the creation of the atomic bomb, the Air Force required a new heavy bomber capable of carrying the massive new bombs. One plane under consideration was the Northrop YB-35. Compared to the N9M, which only had a wingspan of 60 feet, the YB-35 had a wingspan of 172 feet, 112 feet wider than the N9M. The YB-35 first flew on June 25, 1946. It had a potential payload capacity of 10,000 pounds of bombs, but was still too small to carry nuclear bombs of the era. However, the YB-35 was designed to be propeller-driven, and by the time it took flight, jet power was seen as a better alternative than propeller. Northrop countered with an altered version of the YB-35, the YB-49, which first flew on October 21st, 1947, with an increased payload of 16,000 pounds. But it wasn't just seen as a potential bomber. Northrop himself envisioned it as a passenger aircraft. At the time, it was faster than any other passenger aircraft in the sky. Estimates show it could have flown from the east coast to the west coast in under four hours, and would even be equipped with a sky lounge with an observation area, something that would be unprecedented even in today's passenger aircraft. But that was all about to change. Before the YB-49 could enter service, it faced several issues. The first one was that due to the lack of a tail, it was highly unstable and was considered by many as dangerous to fly. It didn't help when a major accident occurred. On June 5, 1948, pilot Major Daniel Forbes and co-pilot Glenn Edwards, along with three other crew members, were flying in the YB-49 when it departed the control flight and broke apart mid-air. According to reports, it's likely that heavy loads were imposed on the airframe in an attempt to recover control following the stall, but this has not been confirmed. However, one of Edwards' fellow test pilots, Robert Cardenas, believed that Edwards had intentionally stalled the aircraft, something Cardenas had warned him to avoid, as he had discovered it sometime earlier. Cardenas expressed this concern in an interview with the History Channel show Modern Marvels. In honor of Glenn Edwards, the Air Force Base where all test flights were conducted at this time was renamed Edwards Air Force Base, which is still in use to this day. It wasn't just the control of the aircraft that was facing problems. The YB-49 was facing competition from fellow aviation company Convair. The aircraft they had developed was the B-36 Peacemaker. Although the aircraft was seen as outdated, at that particular point, it still had much more control compared to the YB-49. It also suffered from slightly fewer setbacks in the YB-49, something that was critical in a time of budget cuts due to the end of World War II. Another drawback was that the YB-49 was less fuel efficient than the B-36, as its jet engines consumed more fuel than the prop engines the B-36 utilized. On March 15, 1950, the YB-49 project was cancelled, followed by the Flying Wing project two months later. On the same day the YB-49 project was cancelled, the Air Force ordered that all YB-49s were to be destroyed. According to reports, the Air Force brought giant mobile smelt machines to where the planes were and scrapped them right in front of Northrop employees. A single version of the YB-49, the YRB-49A, a reconnaissance version of the plane, was abandoned at Northrop's Ontario Airport until it was ordered scrapped by the Air Force on December 1, 1952. That same year, Jack Northrop left the company he founded and never really ventured into aviation for the rest of his life, due in major part to the destruction of the Flying Wing. Jack Northrop refused to talk about the YB-49 until he did an interview in 1979. In the interview, he put full blame on the YB-49's cancellation on the Secretary of the Air Force at the time, Stuart Symington. 
According to Northrop, Symington demanded that Northrop merge his company with Convair. Northrop responded to the request by asking, Mr. Secretary, what are the alternatives? According to Northrop, Symington responded angrily by saying, you'll be goddamn sorry if you don't. He went on to say Symington got revenge by scrapping the YB-49. While the story has never been fully confirmed, Symington did later admit that he pressured Northrop to merge by saying, I may very well have suggested that he merge his company with Convair, who we knew was going to get business. Interestingly, Symington would later leave the government after serving as a senator to head Convair. Whatever the case may be, the loss of his flying wing broke Northrop. He receded from the public eye. In 1976, he felt compelled to communicate to NASA his belief that the flying wing was a useful idea. NASA responded by saying the flying wing had not been abandoned. It wouldn't be until the months leading up to his death that he would find out he had been right. Several months before he died in late 1980, Jack Northrop was brought back to the company he had founded. By this time, the company had merged with Grumman Aerospace Corporation to form the Northrop Grumman Corporation. Unbeknownst to him and the rest of the world at the time, Northrop Grumman had been working on a classified program, also known as a Black Program. The program would result in the B-2 stealth bomber. Northrop Grumman engineers had put together a bomber using 3D modeling, software labs, and computer systems, among other methods. It incorporated stealth technology, which helped it from being detected. Jack was presented with a model of the forthcoming aircraft. By this time, Northrop was in failing health and was unable to speak. According to witnesses, Jack reportedly wrote on a piece of paper saying, I know why God has kept me alive for the past 25 years. Northrop sadly passed away on February 18, 1981, 16 days after his ex-wife Inez died. The B-2 would be revealed to the public on November 22, 1988, followed by its first test flight on July 17 the following year. The B-2 itself had a setback. With major budget cuts in the late 1990s due to the end of the Cold War and the collapse of the Soviet Union, the order for 132 was trimmed down to 21. When the first test flight was flown, Cardenas reportedly told the test pilot not to do what Edwards had done, stall the aircraft. The test pilot, Bruce Hines, reportedly came back and when questioned by Cardenas, responded, The damn thing wouldn't let you. This was because Northrop Grumman had installed over 136 standalone distributed computers that helped keep it stabilized during flight, something that wasn't available when the YB-49 was being designed. One interesting detail connecting the B-2 with the YB-49 and the YB-35 is that they all have the same wingspan of 172 feet. Whether or not this was intentional is unclear. The B-2 would enter service on December 17, 1993. Due to there only being 21 built, the aircraft were given names related to their nickname, Spirit. They are called Spirit of America, Spirit of Arizona, Spirit of New York, Spirit of Indiana, Spirit of Ohio, Spirit of Mississippi, Spirit of Texas, Spirit of Missouri, Spirit of Missouri, Spirit of California, Spirit of South Carolina, Spirit of Washington, Spirit of Kansas, Spirit of Nebraska, Spirit of Georgia, Spirit of Alaska, Spirit of Hawaii, Spirit of Florida, Spirit of Oklahoma, Spirit of Kitty Hawk, Spirit of Pennsylvania, and Spirit of Louisiana. The B-2 has seen combat since its introduction during the Kosovo War. The aircraft is also noted for long-duration flights. As such, the aircraft has a toilet that sits behind the co-pilot, the mission commander. It had a payload capacity of between 40,000 and 50,000 pounds of bombs, which are carried in its two internal bomb bays by utilizing a rotary launcher. With that in mind, the B-2 can carry almost every type of bomb in the U.S. military arsenal. When the B-2 was first built, each plane cost roughly $2 billion, making it the most expensive aircraft in history. On February 23, 2008, the Spirit of Kansas crashed on takeoff at Anderson Air Force Base in Guam. Both pilots ejected safely, but one was hospitalized and the aircraft was destroyed. The cause of the crash was determined to be that of the onboard computer miscalculated, resulting in an unrecoverable stall. Since then, several more B-2s had accidents to variable degrees, but none as severe as the one involving the Spirit of Kansas. 
All remaining B-2s are assigned to the 509th Bomb Wing at Whiteman Air Force Base in Missouri. While no B-2s have been retired, the test model, named the Spirit of Freedom, is on display at the National Museum of the United States Air Force in Dayton, Ohio. Otherwise, B-2s had made recurring appearances at air shows across the United States. The B-2 is one of the most iconic aircraft in history, mainly due to its ability to utilize stealth technology and has paved the way for other stealth aircraft, including other forms of stealth, mainly the F-22 and F-35, but also in drones like the Lockheed Martin RQ-170 Sentinel, which is also of the flying wing design. While not the first stealth aircraft ever put into service, it was a game changer in that it was the first aircraft to be completely stealth. The F-117, for instance, could still be seen even by antiquated Soviet radar at certain points. The B-2 is scheduled to start being replaced around the 2030s by its replacement, another aircraft of the flying wing concept, currently being developed by Northrop Grumman, the B-21 Raider. The B-21 Raider first flew on November 10, 2023, with it scheduled to enter service by 2027. The B-2 and B-21 Raider wouldn't be possible if not thanks to Jack Northrop, a man who gave most of his life to prove a concept that may have been ahead of its time, but eventually became a massive success and is still paving the future of war. While Jack Northrop's name has been largely forgotten, his life's work will be remembered in the form of the B-2, the B-21, and more in the future. He is a hero who might not be remembered name-wise, but his legacy will continue to be seen for generations to come.